Welcome to the Triage Method Podcast Q&A edition. This is the episode where we basically answer a question that has come in from one of our followers. This week, I hate the word followers as well. Can we like say something else? I don't know. No, from, from, you always say, the thing that you always say instead I say of fam. is, no, you say team, which is Fair. quite possibly the most loser statement or comment or yeah. Adjective, whatever the fuck, noun, whatever fuck the word is. Adjective, are you? Really? Um, it's the worst word you could possibly use. All right, team. No, I don't dis. I don't. I don't disagree. You know, but uh, yeah, it just it just makes sense in some context. But anyway, no, it doesn't ever, never, not once. I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna, gonna, team. Um. All right, I'm just gonna call them the apostles. So okay, that's better. To all of our to all of our apostles who follow us, worship us, etc. Um, that's, that's where the question, that, that's anyway. basically where the questions come from. This week, the question came from someone on my personal Instagram, my own apostles. And basically the question was, <laughs> have you guys ever talked about arm programming on the podcast? If not, could you touch on it? Basically, how do I train my arms? Pretty simple question because they're pretty simple muscles, but it's still worth, you know, teasing out. Um, we were just talking about before we came on the podcast about how neither of us particularly enjoy training our arms. That may be evident, at least in my arms. <laughs> um, Paddy, Paddy, Paddy's, Paddy's got pretty, pretty good arms, you know, pretty good peaks, but unfortunately he lacks the I distal portion pretty- of a bicep. So that's not particularly helpful. Um, but yeah, basically how do you train, how do you train your arms? And I suppose the, the, the starting kind of level one, like baseline answer to this is is you just train them like any other muscle group and you give them exercises accordingly and it's about as simple as that however it's not so simple either because your biceps your triceps are very often trained in a sort of indirect way through a lot of the other exercises that you do so for example the vast majority of people are going to be doing some sort of row or pull down exercise to train their back if they're trying to strengthen their whole body and as a result you're going to be training your biceps or your, your elbow flexors. So it's not just the biceps, the other muscles in that area. You're going to be training them already um, with, with quite a bit of load sometimes. And for that reason, you will have some people, um, for example, power lifters and you know, people who are, were always into strength training who suggest that you just don't need to train your arms at all. Just do all these heavy exercises and you'll look and they'll, they'll often say like, look, this is how my arms grew. It's all from heavy pressing, all from heavy rowing, etc." And that's fine. If you're someone who has been very sensitive to training, has gotten very positive adaptations to doing those exercises, and your arms grew in the meantime, because obviously we all have different sensitivities to training stimuli. And if you know at this point that you're a few years into training, your arms haven't been growing, then you've already got the evidence to suggest that you may not be as sensitive to those individuals who are telling you how to train. So I think it's always important to question when someone is telling you what they do, like, is is there some reason that they might be telling you, for example, like they they actually just have really good arm genetics and that's how they got here? Um, so yeah, that's kind of the the starting point here. Is that one step? One is like you just train them. Step two, they're kind of already being trained. So that kind of brings us on to the real meat and potatoes of this discussion, and that is, you know, how do we actually start to train them if we are going to try and give them some direct work? Yeah, and I just want to put onto this this greasy sales pitch while we're discussing this. Like, we do actually have training templates on our website, right? So, like, even though this is going to be some sort of esoteric discussion around training arms, and we're going to give you the information, and if you actually want to see this practically applied, like, there are some programs within those templates, that, you know, have arm days or shoulder and arm days. You know, um, again, you can see with the the rationale why that is. On, on those programs, you know, and we'll get into some of that here now in this discussion. But if you are kind of going like, here, look, I actually just want to listen to a podcast on training arms, but I also want the information, then just go buy the training template ebooks mm-hmm. and you'll you'll see the information presented to you there, right? So get that out of the way. But to go back to your your point uh, earlier on about like basically compound movements training your arms, that's something that again you have to take it both ways you have to look at it both ways first of all you're going to have individuals that get great results just from doing compound exercises right they do their fucking bench press they do their i don't know incline bench press 
and their triceps are jacked out of their mind, you know? And you're just like, okay, well, like I've been doing both those exercises and my arms aren't up to scratch, right? However, what, what you'll often see, and I would say probably more often see because realistically there are more beginners than there are more advanced lifters uh, or even intermediate lifters, like there, there simply are more beginners. There's less people that exercise than people that exercise, okay? So that's always going to be the case. Um, and what you'll more often see is people who <laughs> have not spent a significant amount of time doing compound exercises and then asking questions like, oh, how can I maximize my arm growth? You know, and it's, it's just simply a case of you just need to keep training your compound exercises for longer and the results will come. Now, even though I'm saying that, that is probably not the way you're going to maximize your arm growth. However, it is an important uh, point to make because, again, all of this stuff, all this arm training stuff that we're going to discuss is somewhat irrelevant if you just lack muscle mass all over, you know, like if you, if you, like your arms aren't skinny, you are just skinny. You just don't have muscle. You know, it's not that you are lacking in the arm department. You're lacking in the overall muscle development department, you know? Yeah. So that has to be sorted out, you know, while you layer on arm training, you know, like you can't just like people always go on and kind of somewhat laugh about like spot reduction of body fat. Um, but then, will happily turn around in the same sentence and be like, yeah, so I want to uh, sight enhance uh, with uh, my exercise, you know, my training. And it's like, yeah, you can do that to some extent, but at the same time, it's like, you have to grow as a whole. Like, you know, like obviously if you only train your arms, you know, your arms are probably only going to grow. However, you'll likely lead, that'll likely lead to a situation where you are limited by other muscles and not be able to progress your arms overall so effectively what i'm saying is you need to get strong all over to earn the right to an extent to focus on training your arms however that doesn't mean that you can't prioritize your arms as you are focusing on getting stronger overall you know like you can still want to maximize your arm growth while you are still getting bigger overall you know so Effectively, what I'm saying is you need to train your chest, you need to cha train your back, and that'll look after your arms to a large extent. And then once you're doing that or have done that, you then layer on your arm training, you know? Yeah, so I suppose like when we get to that point then where someone has kind of ticked those boxes, like, like the vast majority of people who would be asking these questions, you know, All right, how do, I, how do I dial in my arm programming? You've probably been training for a while, you know, you've done the the, the basics, so to speak, you know, you're doing your chin ups, you're doing your rows, you're doing your presses. So there's some degree of stimulus that's being applied already. And maybe you're kind of throwing in the odd bit of a, a set of bicep curls here and there at the end of your workout. Uh, or maybe you're on the total other end of the spectrum and you've got like multiple arm days per week. I don't know. But I like a point that I'd like to make that I don't think a lot of people realize is that you are allowed to do whatever you want with your training. Like you have the right to prioritize whatever you want. So like, I know that it, it can often seem like we have this kind of collective value structure or like we all get like massage our ego at the same things by saying, you know, you got to train your legs, bro, or it's all about compound movements. But like if you're exercising and you're just like, right, I've, I've been training for years now, but I really just want big arms and that's kind of all I care about. You're allowed to put bicep curls at the start of your workout. You're allowed to put um, some rope extensions at the start, start of your workout. You're allowed to do them before your bench presses, before your rows, whatever. Okay, so that's a really important point to get across because I think a lot of us are just like, oh, I don't want to be seen to be that person or no one else does that. Like that's not the way workouts are structured. And again, it's this point that I brought up before that a lot of what we do is the result of path dependence in that you are doing what you do now because of what others have done in the past. And unless you have the same exact goals as the average person that has come across time, then you have to question exactly, you know, what is going to be best for me? Um, so with that in mind, if you were to really try and prioritize your arms, then having some exercises that include, quote unquote, isolated elbow extension and elbow flexion is going to be a little bit more of a priority so the 
the muscles at the front of the arm, they're the muscles that basically flex the elbow. So they bring your hand up towards your shoulder. Um, the biceps also help to turn your palm up towards the ceiling. So that's, that's called supination of the, the radial ulnar joint or just the forearm, you can think of it. So that's why you typically see people turn their palms up. So this is just basic like one-on-one of what we're trying to achieve. Um, the, on the other side of, of, of the arm, you've got the extensors. So you've got the elbow extensors and they're your tricep muscles, okay? Primarily the tricep muscles. And basically that has three heads. So one of them does actually cross the shoulder joint. So it has a bit of an extra function there. Similarly, the biceps in the front of the arm also crosses the shoulder and has a bit of a function there. So there are some accessory functions at the shoulder joint, but primarily what we are talking about is movement of the elbow joint. So you've got resistance stopping you from lifting your hand up into elbow flexion, and you've got resistance stopping you from pushing your your hand down into elbow extension. So like very simply, that is pretty much what you are trying to achieve when you are training your arms. So from there, you can start to ask yourself, how can I begin to apply resistance against those movements? And like, that's why people choose the exercises that they do. So for example, different variations of barbell curls, dumbbell curls, cable curls, machine curls, etc. Basically, any type of curl is going to be taking care of most of the muscles um, to a large extent in the front of the in the front of the arm or the front of the upper arm rather. So there is still some merit to you know practicing different grips and things like that. So for example, having a reverse grip or pronated grip where your hands are facing down, that can help you to target some of the forearm muscles a bit more in the posterior forearm. So you're typically going to feel that a little bit more in like so the back of your arm, the back of your forearm, and maybe your brachioradialis, so that kind of big thick muscle that's on the the lateral aspect of the elbow, just running into the forearm. So, point there being that playing around with your grips a little bit is definitely helpful. It's probably going to help um, which muscles are doing a bit more of the work at different points in the range of the, in the range of motion, and variation also just keeps your your training interesting. So, from an exercise selection perspective, when I'm thinking about the elbow flexors or the muscles at the front of the arm, I'm thinking of anything that allows you to um, flex the elbow against resistance with different grips. I think that's a a nice thing to include over time. So that's something that you can keep in mind. So for example, if you were to have three different grip variations, you could have one where your hand is, or your forearm is supinated. So for example, a regular barbell curl, so palms facing up, you could have a reverse barbell curl or a reverse cable curl, whatever, where your palms are facing down. And you could have one in the middle where you're, you're basically, you're, you're kind of in a thumbs up grip or a neutral grip. Um, what what some people would call a hammer curl. So basically, you're taking care of those different positions. Um, that's one way of thinking about it in terms of grip. You also might want to think of it in terms of like shoulder position. So it might be the case that doing one exercise where your shoulder is or your your arm basically is down by your side. So in a standard kind of dumbbell curl, um, that's going to have the biceps in one particular length, and it's going to change the the contribution versus you being, let's say your arm slightly behind the body. So some people will do that where they're lying down um, on an incline bench with your arm kind of hanging down towards the floor and um, basically an incline dumbbell curl with the arms hanging back. That's going to have that basically long head of the biceps in a more stretched position at the bottom because it crosses the shoulder joint. Similarly, on the opposite side of the spectrum, if the, if the shoulder is slightly flexed, then you're, you're going to be basically shortening that long head of the biceps a little bit more than you otherwise would. So basically, you've got those variables to play around with, your grip, you've got shoulder position, um, and then you've also got the types of exercises that are the types of resistance that you use. So for example, there might be a difference between a particular machine and a barbell and a dumbbell and maybe uh, cables or whatever you, you happen to be using. So basically, variation is the key there. My point is not that any one of those things is better than the other. So what I would seek over time is variation, particularly because as Paddy and I were discussing before we started this podcast, arm training is pretty boring and it gets very boring to do the same exercise over and over and over again. So varying them from training training cycle to training cycle is probably a good idea. Um, On the opposite side of the spectrum, the the triceps, like they're a much simpler muscle to train um, because they don't, they don't, they don't actually cross the, or they don't act on the radio ulnar joint to change your hand position so when we were talking about the biceps we said that they basically supinate the forearm or the radio ulnar joint whereas the biceps they basically t- attach directly onto the olecranon process of the ulna and that basically what that means very simply is that it's not going to affect the position of your forearm so when you're talking about the the triceps you're looking for an elbow extension exercise but again there might be some merit to changing your shoulder position so like we were talking about with the biceps 
training the triceps with, for example, uh, the shoulder at 90 degrees of flexion, like you do when you do a skull crusher type of exercise, or training the triceps with the arms, maybe moving slightly behind the body or with a, a, an accessory kind of shoulder extension function. So some people will do... Um, They'll do a rope extension, um, and basically what they'll do is they'll drag it slightly behind their body a little bit, and that's basically helping to get that long head of the triceps a little bit shorter than you would if you were just um, moving with the arms slightly in front of the body. So there you go. Again, like the you're, you're thinking about different types of resistance. You're thinking about changing the shoulder position a little bit. The grip position is not as much of a consideration when it comes to the triceps because, as I said, it doesn't really it's not really affected by radio ulnar joint position. However, that's not to say that different grips mightn't feel better or worse for a given person, because what you might find is that a given grip helps you to um, have a better position at the shoulder joint, because um, you can change your grip can change your shoulder position, and we know that the triceps cross the shoulder, or at least the, the long head does. So there are some of the considerations that I would keep in mind when it comes to exercise selection. Now, that's all very good and well, right? So mm -hmm. we understand our anatomy, biomechanics, all of that stuff again like we have articles on site i don't know i don't know if you have your the arm articles done yet but either way you can still understand the basics of anatomy and biomechanics and also you can go okay well this stuff is obviously important so i have to go away and learn it right so if you're choosing exercises the exercises should have a reason based on the anatomy biomechanics of those muscles joints whatever involved right so that's perfect that makes sense for exercise selection. I'm not going to turn this into a two-hour podcast and be like, oh, this sc skull crushers work this function. You know, forget about that. Yeah, yeah. Right? Again, there's articles on site. We discussed that kind of stuff before. If you want to see it practically put together, again, you can look at the, you know, the if I could speak, uh, the, the templates that we have. You know? um, so that's perfect. Right, the next thing then we have to consider is the overall volume we should be doing when training arms because there is a bit of a, a special consideration for this right because generally speaking right a very generalist you know catch-all statement we would probably say that training muscles twice per week is a good starting point and then generally looking to do somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 sets per week for that muscle group right and that still holds true for the, the biceps the triceps however like we were discussing at the start of the podcast you are effectively using those muscles for other exercises right so it's it's really hard to fully delineate the exact you know uh, percentage that mm -hmm. these muscles are contributing you know you'd have to do it for you as an individual based on the exercises based on the joint angles all that kind of stuff right but you don't need to do that right yeah. however you do need to realize that your arm muscles are being worked in all these other uh, compound movements if you want to call them that right so that generally means that you can get away with a lower volume of arm training and still elicit a good response right that however doesn't mean that you can't do more if you want to you know um and this this is practical in that once you understand that they're still being trained when you're doing your chin-ups like say your biceps are still being trained when you're doing your chin-ups your rows whatever um you have to then realize that okay so if i do want to put a little bit of uh, icing on the cake so to speak and do some curls you know i probably don't need to allocate 20 sets for the entire week for biceps you know and what you can probably get away with is a lesser number of total sets per week you know so if you were just looking to generally you know you're like oh i'm doing all my compound stuff and i want to you know grow my arms make sure they're keeping up and staying strong or whatever and um, you could probably get away with the first of all at least the lower end of the volume recommendations for the week so we'll say 10 sets so that could look like five sets of a bicep curl at the end of your back workout say you know, twice per week, you know? So you don't need to necessarily program multiple exercises for multiple sets, you know? However, you could also look at that and go, okay, well, I want to ensure that I'm training 
the different functions of say the bicep you know the, the triceps are a little bit easier but again like the different functions of the bicep and i also want to hit those forearms as well while i'm doing it you know be economical with your time like you could do something like two sets of two different exercises twice per week you know so again that's we'll say four sets per workout and then you're getting eight sets per week you know and you could even go okay i'm going to put in some sort of intensity boosting technique on the second set of each of those or even just the last set of that ex that, that exercise selection you know um so effectively what i'm saying is you can get away with lower volumes of arm training you don't need to do what would be generally recommended for other muscle groups because again your arms are being trained when you train those other muscle groups however if you are looking to prioritize your arms and you're like, I actually just want to, you know, put a lot of emphasis and I just want to keep all my, my chest, my chest is great. My back, great. My shoulders, great. You know, but arms, mm, not so much. They're just, they're not up to, to scratch. They're not up to par. You know, I want them to be 20 inch pythons, you know, uh, you can still then, and it should make sense then for you to naturally reduce your volume on the muscles that are you know where you want them to be like why are you trying to push the envelope with them when you're, you're happy with where they are and you can reduce the volume on those and then increase the volume on your arm training which again makes sense because you are reducing the load that your arms are taking by doing your compound exercises so you are in effect doing lower volume for your arms then as well so you may then just to bring up your arm volume to where it previously was you may need to then increase more sets beyond that to actually push further so it's a little bit of a hard one so what i mean by that is if you say oh okay chest is great back is great cool that's all fine i'm going to reduce my sets i'm going to do the very low end of volume recommendations i'm going to do 10 sets whereas you previously were doing 20 sets per week right that means that a percentage of your arm training has been reduced right so to bring it up to that level like you might think, oh, I'm going to now do 20 sets for my arms. And I was previously doing 15 sets. You may only be bringing that up to the level that you were previously at while you were pushing your heavy compound exercises. So you may need to push it a little bit further beyond that. You know, you might need to do 25 sets, you know, so that's just something that you need to keep in mind. So Gary, do you have anything to add to the, the volume discussion on arms? No, I think that's pretty solid. I think one of the mistakes that some people make, especially when they do like uh, arm days and stuff, for example, is that they just do a lot of sub-maximal work and like don't actually do good quality work, you know? So for example, what people will do is they might do like four to six biceps exercises and it's all like, you know, 10 to 15 reps and like, yeah, you know, they're kind of getting a pump and they're, they're doing reps, you know, and they're, they're fast and they're, they're getting it done and they're sweating but like, if you were to actually look at their last rep, a lot of the time, it's like, ah, uh, if you slowed that down and really focused for a while, you could probably like, you could probably get another five, at least five reps, you know, you've got a lot more in the tank. Um, and I think that's, that's telling because what a lot of people will do is on their, on their pressing, for example, or their squatting, they're super focused. They're going into this set with, you know, this intense focus. They're looking at the logbook and they're thinking, I got to beat what I got last week. Um, or at least I want to match that because that's where my level of strength is. That's why I've got to make sure that I'm creating the conditions that are going to allow for maximal performance. Whereas when it comes to training arms, it's kind of like, oh yeah, here we are. You know, we're doing some curls, boom, 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 easy work. Um, it's not the same level of focus. So if you are trying to develop a muscle or any skill, like you have to focus on it and you have to treat it with the same respect that you would any other exercise. So when you are trying to see how much volume you need, don't just go in and start doing casual reps. Like you have to say, how can I get the most out of every rep that I do and out of every set that I do? And that doesn't mean that you have to go, you know, all the way to failure, but it means that you have to work hard enough so that your one to two from failure or whatever is actually one to two from failure and not five or six. Um, because very often what you'll see is that people can go so much further than they think they actually can. Um, and especially true for, for arm training. So that's a simple message. Focus on what you're doing, like put in the effort. Like obviously it's, it's a simple message everyone should be familiar with, but it's often skipped when it comes to smaller muscle groups. And then from there, what you want to do is, you know, see what, 
see, see how long it takes you to actually recover from your session. So for example, if you add in three to six sets of bicep work twice per week, then see how sore you are the next day. See, like, see, see what sort of uh, subjective markers you can garner from that. Because like, as we said in the last podcast, or in a few podcasts ago, rather, when we we're talking about delayed onset muscle soreness, different muscles and different exercises are going to make you more or less susceptible to experiencing a lot of muscle soreness. And a lot of the exercises that we do for arms, they don't tend to, you know, put them put the muscle in like under a lot of tension in the stretched position. So that will be different from something like in um, RDLs, for example, for the hamstrings. If you're doing a lot of volume of RDLs or stiff legged deadlifts, you're you're place, basically placing placing the biggest load of that exercise in the position where the muscle is stretched, and as a result, people tend to get pretty sore um, in those muscles. Whereas with something like a bicep curl, you know, the load is pretty much greatest in the middle of the range of motion. So that might mean that you're a little bit less sore afterwards, especially as you get used to training. So if it becomes a case where you feel recovered a day or two days later, but you're not training your arms for four days, then that's an opportunity for you to increase frequency and increase the quality of your work. So this actually ties in with my previous point, because one of the things that you see is that you know, your first exercise or two that you do for a given muscle group, you might feel like it's really high quality work. You're way more focused on it. It's earlier in the session, you know, and so on. Whereas when you're doing, if, if you're trying to do a lot of volume and you're doing like eight to 10 sets for a given muscle, like for example, if it's, if it's three bicep exercises you're doing, you're doing three sets of each. Once you get to the last exercise, you know, you're kind of just fluffing about you know you're not putting in the same effort you're not as focused and um, you've already generated a lot of fatigue especially if it's at the end of your workout so you would actually be better served to potentially increase your frequency to three or even four times per week for arms with less sets because every time you're coming in and you're really focused on the quality of the work that you're actually doing so that's one of the things i like to do when people want to prioritize their arms i don't like to give them nine ten twelve sets per workout i'd much rather see them spread it a bit more across the week, especially because, you know, it, it does seem like there, there is an upper limit to the amount of volume you can do within a given workout and keep benefiting from it. So if you think about that in the context of bicep training, if you're trying to do 12 sets of direct work for biceps in a given workout, but you've also done rows and pull downs prior, that's a lot of sets that are adding up. And it's very unlikely that the latter sets that you're doing are going to be as high quality as if you spread them across the week. So if for arm training in particular, I think high frequency approaches for those who do need a bit more volume and want to push things on a bit can really be helpful. hundred percent. Now there's well, hopefully two final things uh, that need to be discussed with this. And it, it somewhat goes against what you were just saying, but I'm going to, say it these two things tie in together so we're going to discuss the first one and then we're going to come back to the second one but i'm going to say them both here now uh, the first thing is like arm training is inherently unstable right uh, in terms of like there's effectively two joints well three joints moving if you consider the wrist but let's assume the wrist is fixed because it's, it's an easier discussion to have then right um your elbow and your shoulder those two joints are interacting whenever you do any arm training right so if you're trying to maximize uh, we'll say elbow flexion right you have to have the the shoulder uh movement minimized you know however that's just simply impossible for a lot of exercises that are done for you know, the biceps for example right so what i mean by that is say you're trying to progress your easy bar bicep curls right and you're going well everything's good when you were doing it sub maximally training technique everything was perfect you know you were able to minimize body movement you weren't you know moving at the, the hip you weren't turning into some sort of triple extension it's not some olympic lift derivative you're you're you're, you're doing it perfectly right there's very minimal movement at the hip there's very minimal movement at the shoulder and Yes, the, the weight is obviously pulling your center of gravity back and forth, but due to the fact that you have you know, core musculature, you're able to stabilize that. All good, right? However, what you notice then is as you're progressing, say you're doing eight reps on your bicep curls, as you're progressing the weight on those, you may start noticing that there's a little bit more inherent uh, body motion, right? But it's okay because, again, you're understanding that Okay, I'm, I'm like personally, like I'm roughly 100 kilos and uh, say I'm doing curls with 
45, 50 kilos, right? And for, for me to do that, I have to remember that that's roughly half my body weight that is now pulling me forward. Because again, like you're thinking about your arm, your, your forearm is in front of the body. So again, like that, that weight now is in front of your body. So you've effectively got 50 kilos out in front of your body that's pulling your, your center of gravity forward. You know, every time you, sing, every time you do a rep and then back, every time you can finish the rep, either at the, the shoulder level or at the hip level. So there's this inherent movement. But okay, you can minimize that. You're like, as long as my shoulders aren't moving, we're all good. However, what you might start noticing is that the shoulders start coming up, you know? So the elbow isn't in some fixed position. It's, you know, rocking back and forward. And again, you see this quite often in the gym. So someone thinks they're progressing their exercise, but all they're really doing is changing the exercise execution so that they can lift more weight. But it's not the same exercise. They potentially, <clears throat> they potentially aren't loading the same tissues that they thought they were loading, right? So that becomes an issue. And this is a very particular issue to arm training because again like there's inherent instability you can't it's very hard to stabilize the elbow in a fixed position and keep the shoulder in a fixed position and also keep the body in a fixed position if you are you know doing some heavy work right so there's a lack of stability inherently in a lot of these exercises that you're likely to be exposed to right and there are a few exercises that you could do, which potentially would make them better exercises, uh, like more, or exercises that you may prioritize, right? But effectively what I'm trying to say is, there's two things with this. First of all, training arms is unstable, right? There's, there's a lot of stability demands going on overall, right? The second thing then is, that then influences how you both select exercises, but also how you might actually, uh, perform or how you might actually set up your your training program right and what i mean by this is like what we were saying earlier on or what gary was saying earlier on is you see a lot of people they don't actually prioritize doing something like you know very heavy eight rep max bicep curls or you know heavy eight rep max you know tricep press downs or something they they pretty much just focus on kind of fluff work and it's all just like I'll get a little bit of a pump. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm super setting these things and yeah, my arms feel pumped and you know, I'm sweating a good bit, but it's not, it's very sub-maximal work, right? Most people don't do maximal work for their, their arms, right? However, again, it, and it, it seems when you're, you first approach it, it seems kind of contradictory what I'm about to say, but you still need to take the mindset that you are doing maximal work in a different rep range effectively and what i'm saying is you know you may be better off doing reps like a, a higher rep range for some of these exercises purely so that the stability demands aren't the thing that throws you off you know so for example like say again like i weigh 100 kilos like if i progress my bicep curls like my barbell bicep curls to 60 kilos like that 60 kilo demand is only increasing the instability right because again like it's literally six tenths of my body weight always pushing me forward and back so just even at the hip level i'm always going to rock back or even at the body level sorry i'm always going to rock back and forth to stabilize that weight you know uh, so inherently that makes it a little bit more lower back intensive we'll call it um, and there's a likely uh, an increased likelihood that at the shoulder joint i'm going to start doing some movement right so <laughs> what I could do rather than trying to progress that eight rep range with that and get heavier and heavier weights with that, what I might go and do is something like 20 reps, right? Purely so I can keep the, the weight lower, but still put a stimulus or demand on the muscles, right? However, it still needs to be hard 20 reps. It's not just, I, I had like, you know, five to six reps in reserve there and I was just just getting a quick pump like you know that's not what I'm talking about I'm still talking about those reps that well are 15 20 reps are still challenging reps you know effectively what I'm saying is we need to minimize the contribution or yeah the effect of the instability and the way you can do that is by doing higher reps you know that's one way of doing it the other way of doing it is choosing better exercises that are a more stable environment, you know, and we were discussing this just briefly before we came to the podcast and like doing something like a, a machine that 
is designed well to target your biceps is probably the easiest way to progress your biceps, you know, purely because you can minimize all of the, the instability, you can minimize all of the other variables effectively and just focus on progressing your biceps, you know, which is obviously the goal if, you know, you're trying to train your, your biceps, you know? So effectively there's two points there. There's a lot of instability in, in training your arms and there are ways to minimize this. You could either do higher reps that are still challenging, you know, or you could do better exercises. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm with you. And on the, on the higher rep side of things as well, like another tool that can be a bit more useful in the case of arm training is something like occlusion or, or blood flow restriction mm -hmm. training. And like we'll, we'll do a separate podcast on that, but basically that's a tool you may have seen where people basically use a, some sort of strap or tourniquet to basically um, occlude blood flow um, at the upper arm. And basically that can lead to an enhanced hypertrophic response from, from work that you probably otherwise wouldn't get a lot of benefit from. And that's particularly something, and, and high reps in general, are particularly something that are useful for those of you who maybe you want to do more arm work, but maybe your elbows are feeling sore or whatever from previous heavier work that you've been doing. And that's often the case for, for, you know, power lifters and stuff like that. Some power lifters have a lot of trouble with their elbows and adding in supplementary work for their arms, like can feel really difficult. So that, that can kind of change the experience a bit. So, so that's another practical consideration there from the, from the perspective of, of why one might want to do high repetitions, a practical consideration. Again, if you are doing high repetitions, generally trying to push yourself closer to failure is more of a priority. Okay. So that's one of the things that you see in, in the research is that going to failure tends to increase hyper, hyper, hypertrophy. It's, it's more of a priority when the reps are really high. When the reps are lower, it's not as much of a priority and doesn't seem to make as much of a difference. So that's just a, another practical consideration to factor in there. Paddy also brought up the topic of, of um, specific exercises. And like I train in, in motivated fitness gym here in Cork, and basically they, they're really well kitted, kitted out with, with machines and they have like a, a hammer strength um, unilateral kind of bicep curl. And like, it's not like you need machines like this. You don't have to have specific machines, but like, that's an example of a, of a machine that you can do where doing sets of six is actually practical <laughs> for your biceps because you've got restraint on the opposite side of the joint. So stability is taken care of. Um, you don't have to balance your body. You're not being pulled in any particular direction. It's just your elbow is literally just flexing against resistance. Mm. So that's a, an example of an exercise where you can really hone in and focus at a lower rep range. And personally, I kind of enjoy doing that. It makes arm training a little bit more enjoyable than just kind of chasing a pump because it's a bit more focused, putting in more effort. You're really focusing on the, the constraints of the exercise and that's enjoyable for me. You could do a similar thing without a machine. You know, there are ways to, to achieve that. One, one type of exercise that I really like is a dumbbell preacher curl, you know, because again, you're kind of, you're eliminating, like even with a barbell preacher curl, that's fine, but you're still kind of leaned over and the bar it does come a point where the bar is kind of pulling you forward a bit over the seat. Whereas when you just do one arm, you can use the other arm to support yourself, you lock everything down, everything stable. The back of your arm is, is restrained by the, the pad of that, that preacher bench. And then you can just go to work and it's much easier to do work, but there's a little bit lower rep. So for those of you who are, you know, really interested in fine tuning the exercises you choose, they're some of the characteristics that you, you want to consider. For most people, you know, you don't even have to worry about doing lower rep work. You don't have to worry about any particular rep range. It's like find an exercise that allows you to take that muscle close to failure with that muscle being the primary limiting factor. That's such an important point. Because personally, when I used to train my arms like years ago when I wasn't as smart with my training, I used to have like a bit of shoulder pain in my right shoulder and I used to have a, an, an issue with my right wrist. And I basically really struggled to train my arms because they would always become the limiting factors as opposed to my actual biceps, which is obviously the goal. So if you can find ways around that through exercise selection, through repetition ranges, through intensity boosting techniques, whatever, um, then that's a good way of going about things. Yeah, and there's, a, there's obviously loads of exercises we could discuss, but effectively yeah. what you're going to see is exercises that allow stability. Well, first of all, allow body stability, so you're not using a lot of like body English, you know, waving back and forth. Um, but effectively, if you can stabilize the shoulder and you can stabilize the elbow, then you're going to get a much better 
response from that muscle you know assuming again like you're trying to train a particular muscle not a particular movement like you're not doing like a bicep curl competition you know because uh, they they do exist you know do. um um so like something like uh if you're like oh i don't have a preacher curl in my gym or maybe you do have a preacher curl in your gym at the preacher curl bench i mean um you could even do something like you know actually putting your back up against the sloped angle of the, the preacher curl bench and effectively stabilizing your shoulders yeah. and your elbows on that bench you know and then doing dumbbell bicep curls that way so you're effectively leaning back at an angle your shoulders are stable against the bench and your elbows are stable against the bench and do curls that way you know that's practical for some people impractical for quite a lot of people especially if you're tall like me because i would have to effectively be in a deep squat to do to, to do that position on a preacher curl you know and um, obviously you can lean down angle yourself a little bit better but most benches aren't going to be set up for that however what you could do is something like you see those arm blasters you know yeah. the to do you could easily do use one of them you know they're pretty cheap on amazon you know you could use one of them and even that makes stuff like standing curls like bicep curls a little bit more effective because effectively you're able to stabilize the elbow a little bit more right however there they are multi multi-functional tools because you could also use it for something like i'm suggesting there you could sit down now on a bench and put that put the arm blaster behind your back you know supported on the bench yeah. and your shoulders are now stabilized um on the bench and your elbows can now be stabilized on the the arm blaster which is behind your back now you know and you're able to do dumbbell curls with stability at the shoulders and stability at the elbows you know and as a result you'll be able to train your biceps more effectively you know so there are ways around this or, or, or there are ways around the issues that are presented with arm training you know it's just you have to be motivated enough to actually want to prioritize them and also it has to make sense for you to prioritize them as we said at the start of the podcast like all of these things yeah they're they're pretty relevant if you want to train your arms and you know you've been training for a good few years months even um but if you literally aren't able to do some very basic like compound movements it, like again that's your priority not training your arms you know like yeah you have 11 inch arms i realize that that's a, a concern for you and you're like i need to sort this out but you also have you know a 20 inch chest that's that's also a concern so you're going to get a lot of results just from getting more muscle mass in general you know yeah like i mean the, that, that's kind of the key, the key closing point here is that all of this like like these are such fine details and they're literally irrelevant if you can't nail the variables of time consistency and overfeeding like <laughs> you you still have to do all of those basic things and that's off they're often the limiting factors for people like when you see people that have that are very experienced bodybuilders and they've got great arms like they've been training for 20 years it's probably not any one exercise they've been doing it's the fact that they showed up every week or they showed up twice a week to train their arms and they constantly overfed during that time and they weren't afraid to to gain a bit of weight so do keep that in mind because you know if you're the type of person that is really focusing on all the details of your arm training you're trying to nail everything in but you're in this state of kind of permanently trying to stay lean and never allowing yourself to gain any weight then you're basically just being really neurotic about one thing that's kind of like more so an advanced variable to ignore the thing that would actually give you the biggest return on investment. So that's obviously always a message in our podcast. But other than that, I think that's that's pretty good for for this episode. Yeah. Yeah, like realistically, like the finer details of arm training, like yeah, it matters when it matters, but for most people, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> yep. And like as as Vadi alluded to as well, like future articles will go into more detail in terms of like all the details of these exercises and all the details of how you could every permutation of an arm exercise that you could do. But like, if you do want to go back and kind of review basic arm anatomy, those articles are on site. So if you look at the, the upper limb um, or upper body anatomy, um, they're some of the first articles that are in the training theory section. If you do go in, so you can take a look there, see, you can learn all about the, the biceps brachy, the brachialis, the brachioradialis. If you want to learn about all of the countless muscles that are in your forearm, these things probably won't train your training, change your training choices 
very much, but I often find that understanding anatomy a little bit more can it can kind of give you a sense of humility at times where it's like, oh, there's actually a lot of different muscles involved in this and there are a lot of joints in the body and you're never really isolating anything, you know? And if you can understand anatomy, even something as simple as, all right, the triceps attached to the electron on the ulna, whereas the biceps have an attachment on the radius. What does that mean for radio ulna joint function? What does that mean for grip? Like they're things that they sound quite esoteric, they sound up in the air, but the they're really basic things and they're the things that inform a lot of the basic decisions that people make in the gym every day. They're just making them from basically kind of a bottom up perspective. So they've found that these things are helpful, but I think as a trainer, it's good to be able to understand, right, this is what people are experiencing in the gym. And here's my anatomical knowledge to kind of understand why that might be the case. You won't always be right. You know, that's the thing. You can't just predict the relative proportion of like, right, what muscles are working in a given exercise. That's going to differ between individuals. It's going to differ between different tools that you're using. It's, it's, not, it's not that easy to predict that stuff, but starting to get an understanding is helpful. So if you are interested in finding out more about the stuff that we put out, then you can subscribe to the Triage Method newsletter. That's going to be linked below. That goes out every Sunday. And that includes all the content that we have posted throughout the week, along with any recommended resources that we've come across on the interwebs. So that's a good place to keep up with us. You could also join the Triage Method community on Facebook. And that is basically a Facebook group dedicated to people that listen to this podcast, that like our stuff, that are interested in nutrition, exercise science, all the types of things that we try and talk about. And yeah, if you want to have a, a basically a community there that can help you with, you know, different questions that you might have or different issues that you're, you're struggling with, then that's a good place to go. Um, that's where me and Patty basically interact with people most because I much prefer sitting down at my laptop. If someone asks me a question, I can actually type it out in detail rather than just responding on Instagram. Because a, a lot of the time, unless I'm going on to put on a story or something like same for Patty, if I'm going on my phone to go on Instagram, I'm probably on the toilet. I <laughs> probably download the app for five minutes and I'm not going to be typing paragraphs. So there you go. Um, other social media. Instagram is also just so fucking low resolution. I also hate it is. on Instagram the, the actual interactions you get. People are actually so rude, you know? Uh, and I mean that even in the context of just like people are asking you questions, you know, like, and they'll just slide into your DMs and you'll, you'll take the time to answer their question and they'll just scene zone you. And, and you're just like, all right, uh, well, I'm never answering your questions again. <laughs> you know, like stuff like that. You're just like this, like you don't get that on Facebook. Cause again, it's in a group that we're getting these interactions, you know? So there's actually like a community, other people chime in, you know, people talk about their experiences, that kind of stuff. So it's like, it, like that would be akin to someone coming in to your group of friends and being like, Oh, here's a statement and then disappearing like that obviously just doesn't happen in the real world. And um, well, most of the time anyway. And um, so on Instagram, it's just so such a poor form of communication. Anyway, go on, Gary. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Like as a side note, like you should, you should always think before you ask a question or especially before you like share your opinion about like what someone is, is voicing on their Instagram, you know, that, like you said, people don't really think and they just kind of DM you, whereas they wouldn't do that if they had public accountability. And that's why, you know, Facebook groups can be useful. But I always tell people is like, if someone asks me a question, I think it's, it's either rude, abrupt, or they haven't, they clearly haven't thought this out and they've probably messaged it to 12 other people as well, which people do all the time. I'm just like, yeah, like uh, elaborate this and email it to me and I'll get back to you in my own time. Because like, if you sit down and you have to curate an email, you are actually going to formulate your thoughts. So anyway, irrelevant for now. <laughs> That's basically the rules if you want to get in contact with us. Um, if you want to follow our social media, of course, you can follow us on Facebook, our general Facebook page, Triage Method, Triage Method on Twitter and Triage Method on the Instagrams. Um, and then our YouTube channel um, is pretty busy these days. You know, we've got a lot of content going up there. The podcasts also go up there. So if you want to subscribe, go to Triage Method on YouTube and that's where you'll find our podcasts, you'll find our vlogs, you'll find topical videos that don't really, you're not going to see them on other platforms. They're on YouTube ex exclusively. Um, and you're also going to find um, 
I was going to say our exercise library. So video tutorials of exercises um, that we're actually planning on expanding even more now. So it should be fun. Um, other than that, what else is there? Our program templates, of course, as we mentioned in this podcast, if you're interested in, you know, just having a template that you can follow that gives you options, that gives you autonomy. That is the purpose of those templates. You know, <clears throat> understand that if you are buying a program template, the purpose is not to tell you exactly what to do when to do it all the time it's to basically give you a template to follow that you can tweak and that's why we give lots of supporting rationale so if you do buy the program templates and you're like but i can't do that exercise there are variations that are available okay um then you've got the beginner's guidebook don't be fooled by the name beginners the beginner's guidebook is basically a book that is designed to educate you on all the, the fundamentals that we think are important when it's when you're trying to understand resistance training. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, what's volume, what's intensity, what's frequency, like what are they talking about? Then that's a really good guidebook to just give you the things that we think are actually important. Um, so that's a good starting point. Yeah, and of course, hyperspeed one to three years, jump from beginner one to three years. You are a beginner. Sorry. Um, and bring you up to you know the five year mark and do that in the quickest most efficient possible way you know so that's yeah. like yeah because people don't people don't like to admit they're beginners but like you could be really advanced in terms of like you're actually really strong you're actually really muscular but i mean if you the beginner's guidebook can still be really helpful if you don't actually understand how you got there you know or how you're going to make progress going forward so you actually have to understand why different things contribute to the training process or the nutrition process. So still useful. Yeah, um, the group it's coach. It's actually ridiculous that people, well, not ridiculous. Like it makes sense. Like people think they're way more advanced than they are purely based on say strength or, you know, uh, like hypertrophy. Like they just built muscle really, really easily or they just got strong really, really easily. Like again, like my deadlift, like in the first year of training the deadlift, like I literally, the first time I came in, I was able to do like 140, you know, untrained, I've never done it like within a year I was able to do 200 kilos you know so it's like uh that's uh, like yeah I could just be like oh yeah, I'm so fucking advanced because I was able to deadlift 200 kilos like but I was still had no fucking clue what I was doing in the gym like literally no clue I was coming in and just being like yeah deadlift seems fun today let's just bang that out and I'd be doing like sets of like five or sets of three some weeks you know I'd be like there was no rhyme reason or whatever and I just I haphazardly got results, you know? So I could then be like, oh, 200 kilos, especially like back in the day, that was like whatever fucking 2010 or something, you know? Like social media, as we know, it wasn't around. Like I was like, fuck, man, I'm unreal. This is Animal. fucking like, oh, this is powerlifting world-class standard, you know? And it just clearly isn't, um, you know? But like you weren't seeing people deadlifting first of all and you weren't seeing people deadlifting like that uh back in the day back in the day um but i could easily use that and go oh yeah i'm fucking clearly advanced i'm way stronger than these other people but that's not necessarily like i didn't have any of the skills i didn't have any information i didn't have any the understanding and that's what that ebook gives you absolutely and of course you can engage with triage method group coaching which is an offer for another three days so basically until the end of this week you can get 10 percent off with new year 10 is that right new year 10 so new year 10 for 10 percent off the group coaching and yeah i'm actually following the group coaching program myself because i i thought you know you should eat your own food and all that so um i'm enjoying it i'm really enjoying the the group coaching program obviously i'm biased because i wrote the program <laughs> and if you commit you know you're actually giving us money but other than that like it's a great program um yeah, it's, is also following the, the female one which yeah exactly so yeah, yeah, i mean i wouldn't follow it if i thought it was stupid <laughs> so um so yeah basically uh that's 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 the group coaching so if you're if you're into you're into lifting you want to get a bit more guidance you want a program that, to follow just so that you can go into the gym and be like this is what i'm doing today and that's a good place to go you know one of the questions that we often get about the group coaching is like is this a personalized program? And like, no, this is not something that we come up with for you as an individual. But I think the, the thing that a lot of people lack is accountability, consistency, something that is like put together in a smart, clearly thought out way. And if you can like get those things taken care of and be consistent, like you've done most of the work because the reality is that most people, they're not following like personalized programs that have been arrived at like really scientifically. Like, 
even scientists don't really know how to how to truly find ways that we can actually personalize training. As in, it's really unclear why some people respond better than others um, to, to like different training programs. We're, we're resistance training non-responders, so. Yeah, exactly. We're resistance like, training non-responders. And so like if you're following, if you're following a program um, that is designed f- to take care of a, a good proportion of the population, especially because like we kind of understand our audience and we know that the people that are here, um, then that's basically, it may be helpful for you. It may not. You know, if you're an advanced bodybuilder, then I don't think this program is appropriate for you. It's probably a bit below your level. Similarly, you know, if you've never trained and you struggle to walk up the stairs this program may not be for you you may need to scale it back so there is some degree of like all right this isn't for you <laughs> um, but yeah male and female options available there male one male programming female programming i follow the male programming breed follows the, the female programming patty just doesn't actually resistance train because he's not responder out of my mind it's just <laughs> funny you can't see it uh but yeah that's the crack and obviously we have availability for online coaching if you're interested in working with us one to one um you can work with myself or mr patrick farrell so that's it it's too easy nothing else to add it is too easy we do have merchandise available it is linked below i think again like the easiest place to see all the stuff rather than listening to us talk shite is to look at just look below (laughs) or you know join the facebook community or the email list and you will be presented with the information that is presented and yeah, you'll have a fun time. Anyway, I have nothing else to say, Gary, do you? No, it's too easy.